Mel Brooks. Hey. Born in 1926. He's 97 years old right now. Still alive. Jesus. God bless him. Five foot five. All right. Yeah. I insist okay. Matt put the heights. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> He's born Melvin Kaminsky in Brooklyn. Comes from a, a, a Jewish family. His father is a Ger- uh, uh, His father's family were German Jews. I think the subject matter is is pretty personal for him. No. Nah. He started his showbiz career working as a as an assistant for a Broadway producer named Benjamin Kutcher. And in his book, All About Me, he tells the story of his first meeting with this Broadway producer. He knocks and enters the office and the producer is standing there in his underwear and has his clothes drying on a clothesline in his office. Oh. And then he sped back out, said, I'm so sorry. And then he comes back in and he starts talking to the producer. The producer tells him, here's what I do. I raise money primarily from elderly women. Oh. (laughs) And like a lot of producers, I'll raise more money than I actually need, just in case. And Mel says, in retrospect, it's clear this was, uh, <laughs> yeah. this is where I got the idea from. And it's clear this guy is Bialystok and I, the, you know, the naive newcomer, am Leo Bloom. That's kind of where it starts, at least according to Mel in his book. All right. He um, starts working for Sid Caesar. Lacey, we last met Sid Caesar as Coach Calhoun in Greece. And Greece too, but he was a popular uh, TV show host in the fifties, and Mel Mel Brooks was a writer for him, and that's where he met Carl Reiner. Hot take: He's one of the funniest parts of Greece one he and is, two. I agree. He's I agree. fucking sweet and hilarious. That yeah. was one of our takeaways. It was. Um, yeah, we met Carl Reiner on the staff of Sid Caesar's shows, mm-hmm. and they started doing this comedy routine, and it led to them developing an improvised bit, "The Two Thousand Year Old Man." <laughs> Lacey, do you know the two thousand year old man? Mm-mm. Harry, do you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah i i had a uh, i had um and nev- I'd heard of it, but I'd never actually listened to it until recently. And yeah, it's pretty great. It's just yeah. So the the idea is that Carl Reiner will just throw a different scenario at him. You're two thousand years old. What was uh what was what was food like back then? And they would just improvise, and it was oh, different I love every that. time. They'd go on talk shows and do this. They had they recorded albums of this, and it was uh. It was a big hit. And he was kind of um, in the 60s before Mel Brooks ever started uh, making movies. He was kind of a uh, professional talk show ho- talk show guest. Like what? He was on the first ever Johnny Carson Tonight Show. He's he, just a great he's guest good to have. To, he's a good wingman. Yeah. Or just a good interview. <laughs> yeah. Good to come on and do some jokes. Gives, and, gives good interview. Yeah. I love Get Smart. And he, he, yeah. He Sorry. co-created Get Smart. Like I'm it, reading that yeah. on the screen. I, I just it makes sense because Get Get Smart always felt ahead of its time. It was one of my favorite Nick and Knight moments. He had had the idea for the producers, or as it was originally called, Springtime for Hitler. He had the idea in the early '60s, and he, uh, a Broadway producer, told him this won't work as a play. You have too many characters, too many sets. It's got to be a movie. <laughs> oh, so he's okay. like, all right, I'll make a movie, and uh, he brings it to producer Sidney Glazier, who. Loves the idea, and they sell it to Embassy Pictures. And um, in Mel's book, he says, like, at this point, they're talking. They're like, who's going to direct it? And he's like, well, I'll direct it. I've got it all in my head. That way, we won't have to hire another director. It'll all be simple. And they're like, oh, okay. Like, everything is very simple and clear cut in his book. I'd kind of like like a little you more might like. need another source for that, Matt. Yeah, I Yeah, know. okay. A little more thought of, like, what. Why did you decide to be a director? What, what other directors did you like? What were you thinking? thinking about how could the only history of mel brooks be from mel brooks why wouldn't there be another it's not but he's such a like a gadfly so such a um tell so many stories oh. about his career that they're just everywhere these are just the stories he's telling he's trump before trump 60s. he's flooding the freaking news so you can only read his point of view yeah brilliant they're gonna start they're gonna start working on springtime for hitler and he said the only person he ever had in mind for the role was zero mustel who at the time was a <laughs> Broadway legend. He had won three Tony Awards oh, Fiddler for on the Roof. Rhinoceros. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum and Fiddler on the Roof. I think I know him from that. Well, he wasn't in the, he's controversially not in the movie adaptation. Then I do not know him from that. But um, yeah, I, 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 until I've still, I don't think I've ever actually seen Zero Mustel in anything other than the producers. Mm. Have you, Harry? I have, well, other than um, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, that's the only other thing I remember him from. I didn't get to see him in um, 
Fiddler on the Roof. I wasn't born yet, but I had heard that he was a bit of a notorious drunk and very difficult to work with. So I, that might have had something to do with why he was not asked asked uh, by Norman Jewison to do the movie. Um, but one of my, I don't know if you'll get into this, but one of my favorite stories about the producers, specifically the um, the springtime for Hitler piece and the whole the whole scene that happens after that. Um, you know, Mel Brooks, I don't remember what interview he was giving, but he was asked, you know, what, why, why do it that way? Why, why portray Hitler that way? And he said, there is only so much you can say about the Nazis and Hitler that we don't already know. They were terrible. They were awful people. They were garbage humans. They were the villains of history. And they know that they know they're the bad guys and you can't do anything to them or say anything so horrible to them that they don't already know. What you can do is make them the butt of the joke. You can tear down their legacy and tear down their history <laughs> and tear down Hitler by making him the butt of the joke. And that's exactly what he did. And I just, I love that. I love that he went a completely different way to tear down this, this despot, this leader, um, and his, his minions and just turn them into the biggest laughing stock. Yeah. And is, and that's the thing that drives the actual Nazi in the movie. The most crazy is literally just people are laughing, yes. but I love talking during the, I love that he didn't have to go with like some sort of like effeminate. I mean, the guy's effeminate in his own ways because of his big boots and he's, you know, he's just very flamboyant, but like he went with beatnik. He went with someone that's laughable at that time with his right. one little earring. I just like that it that it holds up that it's it's not offensive now that would be a shame right but it kind of made it this little capsule of that time period and and it it's a very rare thing to like take that and it still work now um I've read my share of Hitler biographies okay too and um you there is there is totally a reading just from just from my understanding of Hitler as this weird sort of tortured artist <laughs> like, right he liked like to draw he right he's, paint. he's like five degrees away from a beatnik like he's just wandering around <laughs> trying to sell his art and instead he stumbled on anti-semitism but he's got weird fashion choices you i know? think it like hits close to home that like people know this this guy was a yeah. weirdo this is kind of accurate yeah and also if you look at the movie musical version the the 2005 one i think it was um you know where in that one hitler is portrayed as gay and uh -huh. in that one the joke the the joke isn't that he's gay the joke is that he's hitler and he's yeah. gay and that's what would piss him off the most <laughs> because among the first people killed right. in the holocaust yeah. along with the jews were um were, were trans people gay people yep. um so actual socialists um you know all, all types of of marginalized people and and minorities were were wiped out in the very beginning so to portray the fuhrer as gay would just annoy and and frustrate the hell out of him so i i also i love that he he skewered him in a in a different way without making the fact that hitler is gay the punchline it's not that he's gay it's that he's hitler and he's gay zero mustel the other thing that happened to him is he was always very outspoken about his support for left-wing political causes, including maybe the Communist Party, and this got him blacklisted from Hollywood. Hey, I think Harry did a thing on that. Yeah? I think, didn't you do a blacklist series? I did, series? I did a whole documentary. Yeah. I did, I did a whole documentary on the Hollywood blacklist. Mm -hmm. What is it called? Where, where can we find it? It's on TikTok, and now that I, I have crossed the 10,000 follower threshold, I get playlists. So there is a Hollywood blacklist playlist. Yeah, I did the I did the blacklist among other um, introductions to public um, public domain films and things yeah. during the strike because I didn't even though all the films I talk about are like fifty plus years old, <laughs> I didn't want to talk about the studios right. that made those films. So it really hurt during Halloween time because yeah. I wanted to talk about the Universal monster movies and you know all the stuff that we love to watch during Halloween, all that like the the Hammer films from this. 70s and i didn't get to do that so i i want to link to you to your to your blacklist yeah series i'm reading i'm reading um a biography of j edgar hoover g-man by beverly gage and uh it covers a lot of the red scare era and it's like i've always known about this but now i'm reading it and i'm like people need to talk about this this is insane <laughs> harry does oh there's there's a lot that they didn't bring up during during the the actual blacklist 
There's a lot they didn't bring up during the Red Scare because, you know, it's all propaganda. And that's, you know, we can, we, I don't know if we want to get into it, but like, I firmly believe that the attack on TikTok is because the American government cannot control who's talking on it. They want to control the narrative. They, you know, back during the post 9-11, you know, when we were at war and that had just started, there was this whole big media push that basically said, if you were against the war, you were against America, similar yeah. to the, the blacklist. And they controlled the narrative so well during that time because social media was, was nascent. It was, it was barely my space at that point. Right. And then now where you've got people talking about um, the genocide over in Palestine, and you've got people talking about uh, terrible things employers are doing, how they're not making enough money, how the economy isn't as great as the, the statistics say, and all of this stuff, like they're sharing the truth and the government doesn't like that. And so what do they do? They ban the, the platform that people are talking on. Because of China. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. So the, right. the, the China thing's a, a red herring because yep. TikTok is owned by like 12 global investors, mm -hmm. one of whom is based in Philadelphia and owns like 15% of the company. <laughs> well, if and if it's an American company surveilling on us and owning all our data and doing God knows what with it, it's fine as long as it's an American company. But, but our data is in America. Our data is stored in Texas. Right. Yeah. So yeah. all... All of the, the it, it, every time they they do the thing that we want them to do, they just move the goalpost a little further. Sure, what what, what I think I, I never really understood until recently, until starting to read G Man, which I highly recommend that book. I'm only halfway through it. Um, <laughs> the communism, especially in the 30s, was a you know pretty mainstream position for labor minded left wing people mm -hmm. in America to take, and then it's like the climate shifts, and it's like. Wait a minute! You were involved in communism, right? It's like now the, they're now you were belong. You were like, a but Democrat, every, but we all were doing that back then. But now it now it means something different, and so now we need you to sign a loyalty pledge, or now we need you to to, to give a deposition. And and remember, if you lie on that, you're you're going to be guilty of perjury. And yeah, maybe it's legal to be communist, but you're going to lose your job if you say that you're a member of the Communist Party. Zero Mostel gets swept into this. He gets subpoenaed he testifies before the house and american committee's activity in 1955 and he gives this legendary testimony where he tells them all to go fuck themselves he doesn't name names unlike Ilya kazan and um mm. and advocates like i'm an american i have the right to have my political positions and it's none of your goddamn business uh it's actually really cool and then a few years later people don't care about this anymore and it's like you're fine you can have your career again where we kind of moved on to a new thing. We don't care about communism anymore. It's crazy how it all just fizzled out. Um, they got their control back. But yeah. And then in the 60s, his Broadway career takes off. And again, he has those three Tony winning roles. And then 1967, Mel Brooks casts him in The Producers. He's the only person who could ever play Max Bialystok. It is, it is a performance unlike anything I've ever seen. I've never I, the way he is so intimate and and but mean, but also close and sweet. I, the way he yeah. just turns it on and turns it off, and he's into it and and making you feel like he actually could stomach being with these old ladies, and then he's repulsed. It's, it's just on a dime. But you can also tell like he his heart's not in the old ladies anymore. Oh, of, course, of course, it's just it. Yeah. It's, he doesn't have it in him to pretend to be a dog, but he's going to give it a try. <laughs> Touch me, whatever the fuck. <laughs> right. Um, okay, Gene Wilder. Mel Brooks met Gene Wilder while Gene was working on a play with Mel's wife, and or future wife, Anne Bancroft. And he said, I'm working on a script for a movie called Springtime for Hitler, and you should be in it. Now, don't take any big roles. Uh, we'll be making that movie soon. And then years pass. Five years. And then he resurfaces and he's like, we're ready to make the movie. <laughs> Have you committed to anything? Um, refer, I will refer everybody to our Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory episode where we did a deep dive into Gene Wilder. So it won't, won't say too much more about him, but we, um, uh, we, there's like a, we've sort of coined the Gene Wilder uh, level of specialness where there's like these careers where you're like, the filmography is much shorter than you think it is. So every single time you see them on screen, it's just precious. So Alan Rickman is in that category, right? Yeah. And then who else? There's a third person that we decided. We might be too generous with well, it, but we said Christopher whatever. Lloyd. Christopher, then Christopher, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, Each one is unique little bottle of lightning. But I just wanted to share this anecdote from um, Gene Wilder's book. So this is him. This is him telling the story of meeting Zero Mostel. And Zero Mostel had the right to approve 
the cast. So it was, if he didn't want Gene Wilder to be in the movie, Gene Wilder would not be in the movie. And so this Gene Wilder, a brand new, brand new, uh, guy coming up against this legend of the stage. And this is what Gene Wilder says, quote, a few hours later, I knocked on Sidney Glazer's office door. It was 1130 AM. Mel Brooks opened the door and gave me a hug. I could see zero Mustel in the background. And then Melvin pulled me into the office. Gene, this is zero, zero. This is Gene. This huge round fantasy of a man came waltzing toward me. (laughs) My heart was pounding so loud. I thought he'd hear it. I stuck out my hand politely to shake his, but instead of shaking my hand, zero pulled me into his body and gave me a giant kiss on the lips. (laughs) All nervousness floated away. I think zero did it for that reason. I gave a good reading and was cast in springtime for Hitler. End quote. Yeah, they they had a great time making this movie. That makes me happy. And yeah. you can see it. They would have had to. Yeah. The end. <laughs> That's my insight. Um, okay. Now this movie had a sort of mixed reception upon release. A lot of stuffy old critics said it was inappropriate and uncouth <laughs> and undignified, but others thought it was brilliant. And it wasn't a hit, but it uh did make its money back. And then the 1969 Oscars, Mel Brooks won the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay for this wow. movie. And Gene Wilder was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. A very cool Oscar nomination. I would say. Although the supporting actors, you can get the comedy nominations. It's the lead sure. actors that you won't. Zero Mostel would never have been nominated for, for this role. Lead actors are serious business. Mm. But anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, and then they made a Broadway version that none of us seem to like. <laughs> That's the history. I like the music in the Broadway version, but I couldn't. I, the The movie was so yeah. stylized and over the top. Yeah. I, I couldn't get into it. Yeah, I had to turn it off. I tried to watch it for this, and I was like, I, I get it. I get it. Check. I've seen it done better. Goodbye. And I've seen season four of Kirby Enthusiasm. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about the movie itself. 